Greetings from the Jazz Cloud. I'm Richie Zellen, welcoming you to another lesson on the Jazz Guitar Channel. Today I want to share with you part two of this series. In part one, I explain the psychology of deliberate practice as applied to jazz. And if you missed it, please go back and watch it because not only does this concept fuel the remaining habits, but also in that video, I explain some terminology that I will expand on here. And I will place a direct link to part one in the description below this video. Let's get started. Habit number two. Great jazz musicians are constantly expanding their vocabulary. If you're new at jazz improvisation, you're probably thinking that here they are learning and practicing licks. But when the greats improvise, they are not thinking in terms of this lick here and that lick there. That often results in a fragmented, non-flowing solo because the licks often don't fit the context. Instead, they develop their solos in the same way we improvise spoken words to convey a logical statement with whomever we are trying to communicate. In other words, great musicians understand that jazz is a language and they learn its grammar in order to construct flowing melodic lines on their instrument. So how do they acquire this vocabulary? In many, many different ways. Let's talk specifically about how they use transcriptions. First of all, I believe that in order for a transcription to be useful in helping you assimilate new vocabulary, you have to be able to analyze and understand what makes the solo tick. And great musicians will reverse engineer a transcription to figure that out. That is, they'll analyze the relationship of the notes to the harmony throughout and the overall rhythmic and thematic development of the solo. That said, one of the most important benefits of practicing a whole transcription versus just stealing a few phrases from it is that you get to understand how the solo is developed in the context of the entire harmony. And the key word here is context. So to assimilate how a master improviser develops a solo, great players practice the entire transcribed solo. And the goal here is to uncover an underlying structure, one that reveals how it was designed and most important, how it can be recreated. Once they crack the code, so to speak, they can Practice it with a deep understanding until it is ingrained in their ears and fingers. And this enables many of its ideas to surface when down the road they improvise over that given harmony. I personally first experienced this when one of my mentors had me practice an entire Charlie Parker solo for several weeks. Of course, he only had me do this after I was first able to analyze and understand the solo on paper. Interestingly enough, it wasn't enough for me to play it on my own at whatever tempo I could. Bird himself used to play along with Lester Young recordings before developing his own style. So to follow in his footsteps and those of countless others, I was instructed to do the same. And as hard as it was, it turned out to be an invaluable lesson in learning how to feel and phrase like a bebop player. So the lesson I took away from this experience is when you reproduce a master improviser's work on your instrument in detail, it demands that you pay careful attention to the organized decisions and stylistic tendencies of the original work. This will challenge many of our assumptions and open us up to new perspectives, which we then can apply to our own improvisation. Selecting just portions of solo transcriptions is also useful in the process of expanding uh, your vocabulary, but in a different way. If you can identify a recurring harmonic cadence such as a 2-5 and you love what the artist played, you can still get lots of mileage from it. But you need to learn how to make it your own and then apply it 
in the proper context. And this is the difference between great jazz players and the amateur musician who forces the memorized lick into a solo. You see, great players don't see, for example, a transcribed 251 as a lick. Instead, they see it as a sample of the melodic DNA of the artist they transcribed it from. And with this view in mind, they proceed to break it down into its basic components in order to reassemble it as their own. And this is done by understanding the jazz grammar inherent in any good line. For example, when you finally understand that jazz improvisation is in essence the practice of composing a melodic line over a given harmony in real time, you will probably want to explore its compositional perspective in more depth. And as a side note, let me say that this study can take you beyond the jazz boundaries all the way back to the music of, say, Johann Sebastian Bach. And believe it or not, there is a lot to learn there because Back in the day, it is a known fact that musicians like him used to improvise. This is where it all started. As a matter of fact, classical harmony and composition is all that the great jazz improvisers back in the 40s and 50s had to study with in order to develop their music. So now that hopefully I've made my point about understanding some of the elements of classical composition, let me briefly mention what some of these uh, greats did and how they practiced using these concepts. You will find all sorts of melodic treasures that you can use. Many of these are referred as motivic cells. For example, let's take a bebop phrase and, and uncover some of the uh, motivic cells it contains. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Notice that we have a motif in the first measure. It's the two uh, 16th notes followed by two eighth notes. And then the motif is developed throughout the phrase. It continues towards the end of that first measure. And then we have it again uh, at the end of the third measure going into the fourth measure. After analyzing the phrase, a great musician will develop a mental representation of it, and this enables it to become part of his vocabulary. However, this is done by modifying the makeup of the phrase, making it flexible enough to fit various contexts. Great musicians know that mimicking transcriptions note per note rarely results in greatness. So that said, say the musician has transcribed and reverse engineered a series of phrases by Wes Montgomery. The question he then poses is not, how do I play like Wes Montgomery now? Instead, it's, how do I take Wes Montgomery's formula and make it my own? And the answer is that they have to add their own twist to it. So let's take the bebop phrase I played previously as the source for all the upcoming examples. And by the way, all the examples I'm going to share of this procedure are originally classical composition devices. So who knows, initially the musician might experiment improvising new phrases based on the motivic cells it contains. So in the previous original example, I showed you that there were several motivic cells and the musician might just simply take those motivic cells and practice sequencing them in any rhythm. It could be straight eighth notes first and be able to apply them to any uh, progression, say the same uh, two, five, one in any key. So this is the essence of the uh, motif at least not rhythmically, but those are the notes. So he can take that motif and sequence it this way. Mm -hmm. 
So the musician might then create several rhythmic variations. So here's a possible first rhythmic variation. One, two, three, four. And here's a possible uh, second rhythmic variation, and this one is simplified to include more straight eighth notes. One, two, three, four. Then he might work it out in several fingerings. And here's a possible uh, different fingering that we could use. There's just so many of them, but just to show you. One, two, three, four. And here's another possible fingering. One, two, three, four. Then he might change some of the notes. And this is where the fun really begins because this is where you, by changing the notes, you start making the phrase your own. And notice how it kind of retains the essence and flavor of the original influence. One, two, three, four. Then he might alter it, say from major to minor. One, two, three, four. And there are many, many more procedures, but the bottom line is that in the end, the building blocks of the transcribed phrase become resources that the musician can draw from in various musical contexts and not just the one it was originally transcribed from. And this is the difference between just learning a lick and that of extracting its essence to make it your own. And if you're curious to learn more about these procedures, I want to invite you to check out my books and online course. It's called the Bebop Guitar Improv Series. And in it, I share everything I personally learned from several of the greats in a step-by-step -step set of methods specially adapted to the guitar. I compiled the content of these courses over a 10-year period after teaching it at several universities. So if you are serious about taking your playing to the next level, please check it out by going to bebopguitar.richiezellen.com and you will find a direct link in the description below this video. And this concludes part two. I truly hope you are being inspired to practice more efficiently through this series. And please be on the lookout for part three next week in which I will tell you about the remaining three practice habits of great jazz musicians. As usual, I welcome your likes and comments, and if this is your first time on the Jazz Guitar Channel and you enjoyed this lesson, please subscribe. Until we meet again, be sure to practice, 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 and may peace be with you.